So there was a lot going on. He went to talk to these people and he said, you know, I'm going to try profit sharing. I'd like to give some profit back to the people that worked at my factories. And they all thought he was out of his mind. They started arguing with him. He says, what? They said, what are you thinking about that you want to give your profits to these people? And he says, but they're the ones that made the profits. Without them, I, there wouldn't be any profits. <laughs> they just couldn't understand it. He says, well, we're going to try and see what happens. And so he did. A few years later, he comes back to the same group, and he's one of the few guys that's still standing and doing very well. In fact, he's doing better than everybody else in the state. And he's out in the middle of nowhere. And there's a lot of textile mills in cities, and in the big metropolis cities of Providence, Pawtucket, and Central Falls. Those are the big areas where everybody lives, everybody works. He's out where nobody lives, no, and there's not a lot of factories. But all the factories that are out there, most of them are his. A couple years later, he decides to start a stock ownership plan. Now think about the year, 1916 for profit sharing. Nobody was doing that. 1924 stock ownership. What's interesting about this is 20 years later, the people that bought this stock and got these stock options and stuff buy out the entire company from Mr. Levy. In 20 years. Amazing. Levy keeps going. He starts another factory in Ashaway. This is one of his ideas to get the, to keep from building up the small community he lives in. He looks down the road. And this place, Ashaway, again, was fought by the employees in the company who said, that's too far away. How are we going to work? That, that's, and I'm not kidding you. This is literally 30 miles away. <laughs> but for Rhode Islanders, might as well have been on the moon or something, right? Well, he says, well, let's try. He says, what if I put in $50,000 and we just try it? They said, oh, okay, well, that's good. Yeah, we could do that. <laughs> and so everybody gets behind them. This factory is absolutely fantastic. They're making all, you know, it's doing very well. It's very productive. It's almost as productive as the big mills that they have up in Harrisville. Next thing he does is he says, and, and this is the funny thing about this guy that you have to appreciate. Here's a guy who's willing to experiment with things. He says, what if we put a factory in a place that's never had a factory? What if we put it in a place that's never had a textile mill? What if we put it in farm country where they don't know anything about manufacturing? So he sends a guy out to look for a place that looks like that. And he finds a place called East Woodstock, Connecticut. It has water. He goes to the town. He goes before the town council. And he says, would you be willing to host this factory? Would you agree for us to build the thing and employ people here? And, and this you know, would be farmers and, and people that were mostly manual labor people, which is great for a factory. And they agreed to do that. And so he built this factory there. It did very well. It was much welcomed by the company. They made all kinds of good things. In addition, they had the Woodstock Academy. It's, this, is a, this is a school that's well, well known in the United States. This is what it looks like. It's still operating exactly the way it operated when, when it started back in 1800. So he hooked up with them too. Went, eventually was on their board, gave them a lot of money, helped them along. This school is still operating. It is now the public school operating as a private school for the high school students of this, of this area, which is Woodstock, East Woodstock, and West Woodstock. So he, you can see he's expanded. Now he's got factories in a couple of different communities, but he's not done. He goes to a little town called Mapleville. Mapleville is about the size of that table, okay? Small town, but it has water. The secret to textile and most manufacturing in New England was water, because water is free power. Falling water, the names Patuxet, Pawkatuck, those are Indian names for falling water, and those are the names of these towns uh, in Rhode Island, uh, named after Narragansett Indian places. So he goes to Mayville, he starts there. One of the things he wants to do there is he'd like to build houses for the people. And um, just a small problem. The cost of building houses would be something that the people who will live in them, working in his factories, would not be able to afford to rent. So he says, hmm, let's build them anyways, and I'll just charge you what you can afford. Now, does that sound like Crazyville? No, it was Mapleville. It wasn't Crazyville, it was Mapleville. So he does that, and some people, even in the 70s, were still living in those houses, paying $50 a month. <laughs> it's just impossible to, to believe, you know, impossible. Mr. Levy hears that a lot of textile mills are moving south. He says, well, and this is exactly how he talks, he says, well, if there's some advantage in it 
to be down south. For some reason, I would like to look into it and see if that's true. So he goes down south, he sends his guys down there, and they find a place in Virginia, and they build some mills in three little villages in a, in a valley that has a lot of water. And uh, they do very well, and it just becomes another part of his em so-called empire. It's not an empire, it's just a string of, uh, of mills. The big news that comes to the entire United States happens in October 1929 when there's a great stock market crash. It doesn't throw everybody out of work, but it th throws about a third of the people in the United States out of work. Well, what do you do then? His mills continue to operate. First of all, he had the loyalty of his people because he never laid anybody off. He never reduced wages. He cut hours but never reduced wages. So if you made $50 a week and your hours went, the average work week, by the way, in those days was 60 hours a week. 10 hours a day, six days a week. When they started cutting the hours down to 50 hours and then eventually 48, and for a very short time they did 35 hours, but that didn't last very long. But when they got to 48, you never reduced your pay. You still got the $50, even though you're working fewer hours. So he had great loyalty from the people that worked for him. That really helped him. And so when things got bad, um, he was able to reduce the hours. And then he did something nobody else would have ever done. He built a warehouse to put the production that he couldn't sell. And he started storing it. He said, let's keep on producing. This thing could end any minute. And when it does, we'll be ready. In the meantime, almost all of his competitors went out of business. So it's the depression, people need work. Here's community consciousness number two. He says, why don't we do a community building project and let's build some new buildings for our community. So he goes on to build what are called the Boroughville Town Buildings. He goes on to build a, on the left hand side is a new library. That old building I showed you earlier, they tore that down that had the library in it, the theater. He built a new library. The building on the right is a post office. This is the first post office ever built by a private citizen and given to the United States government. That post office is still being used today, every day. In the center, these two pictures are pictures of the Burrowville Town Hall, built in 1933. They're still being used today and they're the, the most beautiful buildings you'd ever want to see. He also built a high school. He built the ninth district courthouse for the state of Rhode Island, which then paid rent to the village, to the city, or I'm sorry, to the town for its use. He was really a, a different type of guy, wouldn't you say? It was very interesting. He was also a visionary. And I call him a, a visionary entrepreneur because an entrepreneur is somebody who sees things differently. They're, they see things in a way that you will never see them. And they see things that you can never see. Uh, but there are entrepreneurs of all stripes. There are artistic entrepreneurs. There are people who can stare at a blank canvas and create a, a work of art. And we don't know how they do it. And then they figure out a way to sell it. And that's a, an artist entrepreneur. And there are other people that are music entrepreneurs. Well, Levy was all of those things and more. He was a first-class violinist. He owned a 1709 Stradivarius. His wife was a first-class violist. And every Sunday, they had concerts in their home of a quartet. And uh, the community was invited. And they also did a lot of other things. He brought first-class musicians from all over the world to come to Harrisville, a place that they had never heard of and would never hear of again the rest of their lives, believe it or not. But he brought them there because he wanted people to experience culture. And he had these people come in and, and teach the children and, and anybody who wanted free lessons to learn how to play music. Uh, he also brought in first class theater people to teach theater. He built a first class theater that is still there, a 354 seat assembly theater that uh, was used for movies and also live theater, still being used today. Um, and they have brought in people to teach people about how to do musicals, how to do theater, how to do events. Just amazing. He also was a leader in terms of having opinions and ideas about things, and he spoke very often before the Congress of the United States, particularly during the Depression, because he had ideas about how to solve the issues of unemployment, how to solve the problem of lower wages and so on, and what the difference would be if you raise wages. He said raise wages because then people have more money to buy the things that aren't being bought. It's counterintuitive, but he was right. They always asked uh, Levy, you know, he's a great tennis player, he's a musician, he had all these factories, uh, he traveled up widely. 
They said if he had it, wondered if he had a pet project, and he said, yes, I do. People. That's my pet project. That's what I care the most about. And, and, he, and he showed that over and over again. Again, he's doing all these things, but he keeps building mills. Builds a few at Nasonville, another small community. 1936, he adds the Glendale uh, mill, and then in the same year, buys 2,000 acres in, in uh, uh, Hatchet Bay. The same year, he's also elected chairman of the Boroughville Republican Committee. He's been, at, he's been a Republican his whole life, but never active in politics because he just simply didn't have the time. And so this is 36, the big year. 37, he proposes that all of his workers get a paid vacation, two-week paid vacation. 1937. What the heck is he thinking about? But here's the catch. He says, I'm going to pay you, I'm going to give you two weeks paid vacation, but I'm going to pay you four weeks of pay because it costs more to go on vacation than to stay home. Would you like that? <laughs> travel was such a foreign thing to people, he had to set up a travel agency in the offices so that people could plan where they wanted to go. And not everybody wanted to travel. They were happy to have the money and not have to work. Uh, one woman said, uh, I'm going to get a nice set of false teeth. I've never been able to afford them. Another man said, I'm going to go buy a nice tombstone for my mother. She's never had anything but a brick up there. So he went and did that. So the, the consequences of this nice gesture to give them paid vacations, to give them a time to relax and to travel and to see other places and go off with their families, had other consequences that were very positive as well. Shortly after he starts this uh, program, he gets some more mills going. When he bought a mill, he also got the housing that went with it because these were quite large tracts. It wasn't just a building. Oftentimes, it'd be anywhere from 15 to 50 acres of property. It might be as many as 25 or 30 houses or apartments. Uh, and one of the things that Levy liked to do is he would look at the houses and he would walk between the houses and say, you know, there's really not enough room for kids to have any fun in this place because there's not enough room. So he would take every second house out and move it down the street. So they have enough room to play between the houses. I mean, who does that? <laughs> it, doesn't, it just doesn't register with this as making any sense. These are some of the houses he built for his workers. And uh, if you're wondering, here is the very modest home that the Levies had in Harrisville. It's still there. Very modest, uh, two and a half story house. Uh, had a tennis court in the back, which he let people come and play when he was out there. They could use his tennis court. Uh, it didn't have a bowling alley in the basement, didn't have a swimming pool indoors or any of that stuff. It was just a, a nice house. Very, it was just up the street again from his factory, so it was uh, where he could get to it. Uh, one of the other things, I wanted to show you this picture only because you don't appreciate back in those days how much transportation was involved in terms of this kind of a business. He had a whole fleet of trucks because they had to move product between factories. They had to move fac uh, material from one factory to another to have the first part done, they would dye the cloth, or they were going to shrink it, or they were going to cut it, and there were different factories to do those different jobs. And so he had this huge fleet of, uh, fleet of trucks and this huge group of trans what he called transportation workers. Well, 1936, he buys some land out here. What's he going to do with it? He comes down to uh, Nassau, and I wanted to show you what I saw when I first came here. This is what I saw when I first came here. Have you seen that at the airport, the statue? And then the, the Junkaroo band, I saw that over at the Atlantis, so I had to take a picture of it, you know, making all kinds of noise. <laughs> One of the things I thought about is I said, why would he come down to Nassau? And then I remembered this. This is what it looks like in Rhode Island in the winter. <laughs> this is last winter. That's uh, my son's car there. <laughs> so that's why he came to Nassau. Um, Mrs. Levy was very involved with the nurses and nursing organizations in the United States, particularly in a, in a town called Pascoke, which is a little village right next to Harrisville. But it's where it, it was sort of a, another capital of that small town. And she was very involved with a, the group of mostly women who did things like uh, making sure that uh, mothers had milk for their kids and, and little things like that, that this before, really before Social Security, before uh, welfare and those types of things was very important. When they get down to Nassau and they spend a lot of time here, they realize that the kids don't have fresh milk. And they realize that there's all other problems too with nutrition, eggs and, and meat and um, things of that nature. And so, of course, Levy doesn't like to just sit around. Now he has enough money by now, he could do nothing and be happy. 
But he's not happy if he's doing nothing. Are any of you happy when you're not doing anything? Mm -hmm. Besides you, Kayla? <laughs> and Jim? Mm -hmm. 